Hello, and welcome to this presentation on threads in Java. My name is Mike Simpson, and I'll be your instructor for this presentation. If you have questions regarding any of the content covered in this presentation, please use the question and comment box that's located below. We're going to be talking about multi-threading in Java, how you can basically create an application that can carry out multiple tasks simultaneously. A thread in Java is a line of execution that a computer can carry out. And most of the time, when you first create an application, it is single-threaded, meaning they can only do one thing at a time. But a lot of times, you like to have your applications carrying out multiple tasks. So we need to talk first about multi-threading and illustrate how that's going to work. Then we're going to talk about the different types of thread classes. Basically, when you want to create a new thread, you're going to create the class based upon the class called thread. But there's also an interface called runnable that we can use if we have a class that's already been created and we want to give it thread capabilities. Then, once we do that, we're going to talk about how we go about manipulating the different threads that we have. We also have some capabilities for providing priorities to threads. And so we're going to talk about thread modifiers to indicate that when a thread is running, it should get more of the CPU than normal or less of the CPU than normal. Why would we want to even consider using multi-threading on an application? Well, we want to consider using multi-threading on an application because most of the time, we want our application to be able to run several processes simultaneously or several tasks simultaneously. You don't want, for example, to have, say, a text editor that can't do spell checking in the background while you're doing typing. Or you don't want a web browser not to be able to download a file in the background while you're scrolling onto a web page. So to be able to do those several different tasks at the same time, we have to be able to have several different lines of execution running within a process. In Java, we create threads to do that. Once we've created these multiple threads, we may want to prioritize the different tasks that the threads are carrying out. Some tasks may have just have an average priority. Some tasks may want to have more priority than others. For instance, if you're downloading a file, you may want to up the priority on that so that the file download gets completed quicker. Multi-threading also lets you optimize the behavior of applications. Because nowadays, we have processors that support multiple cores, multiple mini CPUs on the same processor. So if you have multiple tasks running, we can take some of those tasks and offload them onto those cores, onto those mini CPUs, so we can parallelize the behavior and get increased performance. So these are several of the many reasons why we want to have multi-threading. We've mentioned earlier that text editors are a good example of multi-threading. Being able, for example, to spell check or format a document while you're still typing it is a good example of multi-threading. And we mentioned earlier that World Wide Web browsers also provide a good reason for being able to multi-thread. You may want to download a file while scrolling on a web page, and you might be composing something else in the background. Or you might have a tabbed browser interface where you have multiple tab windows, and you might want to be switching back and forth between multiple web pages. So once again, you have multiple tasks going. You can't have multiple tasks going on the same time, at least in Java, without being able to do multi-threading. There are some potential problems, though, with doing multi-threading. When you're doing multi-threading, sometimes you have two or more threads trying to access the same pieces of data. And so if one thread looks at a particular variable and says the value of that variable is, say, 1, goes off and does its merry thing, some other variable might come around, look at that same piece of data, change it, and then the first variable, which thought that the value of that original uh, variable was 1, now that thread comes back, and the value of that variable is now 2. So we can have thread conflicts because we can have two or more threads fighting over the same piece of data. So we have to have some methods of protecting methods and protecting our variables from threads. So if one thread is working on some piece of data, we need to make sure that other threads don't try to access it. Because the interesting thing about threads is that when we create our Java process, there's a certain amount of memory set aside for the process and a certain amount of variable space that's set aside. And the threads that are running inside of a process all share that same memory and all share that same variable space. So they can be fighting over the variables. And that means that we have to be able to protect variables being used by one thread from being accessed by another thread. And the other problem with multi-threading is that even simple operations Operations like adding one to a variable or subtracting one from a variable, those are not atomic operations. We may think that they happen all at once, 
but they can actually be multi-step operations. And if they are multi-step operations, then the processor can put a thread on hold in the middle of one of those operations. And then in the meantime, another thread comes in and mucks around with the variable. And then when the first thread comes back, it's completely oblivious to the fact that this value has been changed. So don't assume that simple operations happen all at once in a multi-threaded environment. Now, what do we mean by simple stuff? Well, let's take a look at a basic operation here. Our first basic operation is the following. Important value plus equals 1. Now, at first glimpse, all that it looks like we're doing is we're incrementing this important value. So you might say, OK, we're just taking this variable. It's got the value 10 in it. And we're adding 1 to it, making 11. What's the big deal? Well, what the big deal is is that this actually involves three steps. We have to retrieve that value. We have to add 1 to it. And then we have to store that new value. So that's three different steps, not just one. And if that's running in a multiple thread, we could retrieve that important value. We get it at 10. And then the processor could put our thread on hold. And in the meantime, while we put our thread on hold, some other thread comes in, and it changes that important value from 10 to 72. Now, when our original thread comes back, it says add 1 to the important value. Well, the important value is now 72. So we add 1 to it, and it's now 73. And then we store the new value. And then we're scratching our head trying to figure out why this value that was started out as 10, and we thought it was going to be 11, is now all of a sudden 73. Just doesn't seem to work. So we have to find a way of protecting important variables from being modified by other threads. Now, here's how that would appear in a Java class. We have our class here. It's called bean counter. And then here's the variable, important value. And now I want to increment that important value. So I have this method called add one bean that increments the value. And then I have a method here called how many beans that says return or come up with important value. So the point is that when I call the method add one bean, we might figure that it's just going to do one thing. But because we actually saw that this incrementing takes three steps, we can't guarantee that it's going to happen all at once, not in a multi-threaded environment. So how do we protect that? Well, we can protect that by putting a lock on a particular thread. And putting a thread lock on guarantees that when a particular thread is accessing variables, it guarantees that no other thread will have access to them. So it can put a, essentially what we call a synchronization lock on the variables. And by putting that synchronization lock on, we can guarantee that nobody else is going to be changing them on us. Putting a synchronization lock on the variables makes code thread safe that isn't normally thread safe. And we put these locks in using a keyword called the synchronized keyword. And that allows us to obtain a temporary lock on the variables inside the class. So now, here's how we modify that example. Now, this is the same example as we saw before, but what we did was we put the keyword synchronized in here. By adding the keyword synchronized, that means that when we call add one bean, Java is going to put a temporary lock on the variable important value, meaning that no other thread will be able to change important value until add one bean finishes. So it basically locks all the variables within the class until that's done. So now this method, this important value plus equals one method, will act in the way in which you expect it to, and we don't have to worry about some other thread going in and changing it behind its back. Now, we can also lock full class methods. If a method has static before it's synchronized, just to back up for a minute, you'll see that we have here simply public synchronized. But if we had the keyword static in front of synchronized, then a class method, which would be operating on the class variables, would lock all of the resources in the class and would therefore protect all of the class variables. So if we're going to have a method that's going to be manipulating class variables, and remember the class variables themselves start with the keyword static, then any method that's going to be manipulating it should also use the keyword static as well as synchronized. Now, showing us how to use the synchronized keyword is important but there's a slight downside to the way in which we use synchronized in that preceding example. 
when we use synchronize, we place that lock around all of the code in the add one bean method. Now in this case, add one bean had only one statement, so it wasn't really all that big. But we don't have to necessarily lock the entire method. We can put a lock just around a small part of the code. So if maybe add one bean had 20 statements in it, and only was that one statement that we wanted to lock, there's no need to lock the entire method. We can use a synchronized block, which is the keyword synchronized, and then the chunk of code in curly braces, to put the synchronized lock only around the parts of the code that really need to have the synchronization. And this is more efficient because you're going to slow the system down if you lock code that doesn't need to have a synchronized lock on it. So you want to basically take your synchronized lock and narrow it down as tightly as possible. So the way in which we generally set that up is we use the keyword synchronized inside the method and then an expression which we're going to be locking and we can use the keyword this inside the method to in order to lock all the other variables inside the method. Then the statements we are provided that we're going to lock. So here's how we appear that. Now we're going to go ahead and look again at incrementing here critical value plus equals one. Now we want to protect critical value and that's fine and dandy. But we have the keyword synchronized here so that's going to put its lock starting at the beginning of this method. But there's no need to lock our print line statement because a print line statement, which is output only, it's not going to be changing any values. So there's no point in putting the lock all the way around ink value because print line's not going to change anything and this print line's not going to change anything. We only really need the lock here around the critical value. So how can we modify this? We can modify this by putting the synchronized statement just around the critical value. Now since we want to have the lock on the member variables of the current object, we use the keyword this around the synchronized to indicate that we want to lock the member variables of the current object and then just put the statement that needs to be locked, the critical value plus equals one, inside the curly braces. So that's the way in which you want to do your synchronization, is to make the locked area as small as possible. Those of you that have seen databases will be able to draw an analogy from the database situation where when you create a lock, you want to put the lock on as late as possible and release the lock as early as possible. And that's basically what we're doing here. We are putting the lock on using the synchronized statement as late as possible, just before the critical value statement, and we are releasing the lock as early as possible, just after the synchronized statement. We can also use the synchronized statement if an object that we are dealing with has to access variables in another object. Let us say, for example, that we have a Java object that is going to represent a stock ticker. So periodically it gets uh, values for a stock ticker, and then this is going to update and display values. Well, when this object receives the new stock values, it's going to want to update and display that information, but we want to make sure that the values in the other object, which actually contains the stock price, don't change while we're doing our updating or anything like that. So we want to lock the value that has the stock price while we're doing our updating. So we need to synchronize the access to the other variables from our current object instance. Now that purpose is, again, to prevent the other object's variables from changing while we use them. So if we have our stock object sitting in another variable, we want to temporarily lock that stock object while we get its stock price because we don't want it to be updated in the middle of us trying to look at it. Now in order to block the threads, threads have to synchronize on the same object in order to properly block each other. So if two threads are going to be synchronizing, they will have to both get locks on the same object. And then when one thread has the lock, then another thread will try to get the same lock on the same object. It can't get that lock until the first thread releases the lock. So how does that look? Let's say that we have an object here, and we're going to call this my object. And in my object, we have a value called get value. So we want to get a value from the other object, OB. 
So when we want to get that other object, we call synchronized on OB to temporarily lock the values of the other object, OB. And then when we call the methods here, OB.X and OB.Y, to be able to retrieve those values, we are sure that we are not going to change those values while the synchronized call is. Now, of course, the synchronized call only lasts long enough for us to get the values here because the synchronized goes away at this curly brace. But the point is that we only want to lock OB long enough for us to retrieve the values. So again, we put the lock on just before we retrieve the values, and we take the lock off right after we retrieve the values. Now, if we have a static method, and we want to retrieve some values from the static method, we, can, we lock the static method by using the class literal. Now, in this case, our class is called foo. So when we want to lock the elements in the class with our static method, instead of just passing the object itself, we pass the class literal that is the class name followed by the keyword class. And so what that does is that locks the class so that we can get to the static values. So basically, if you need to use synchronizing for static methods, the synchronize object that you need to lock on is called the class literal. And the class literal is simply the name of the class followed by a dot followed by the keyword class. So that's a little bit of background about threads. Now let's talk about actually creating threads and getting them to work. Well, the basic th class that we use to deal with threads in Java is a class called the thread class. Now if we're creating a class from the ground up, then we're going to want to create our class from the ground up and have it extend the thread class. But what if we have a class that's already been created and we want to make that class be able to run as a thread? Well, the thing is that in Java we cannot have what we call multiple inheritance, meaning we can't have one class extending two or more classes. So at first glimpse it looks like we've got a problem. But remember that although we can only extend one class, we can implement as many interfaces as we want. So if there were an interface that we could implement that could give us the same features as being able to run a thread, we'd be okay. In fact, there does turn out to be an interface that gives us that capability, and that interface is called runnable. So the short answer is if you're going to create a class from the ground up to be run as a thread, have that class extend thread. But if the class already exists, have the class implement runnable. So we define a class that extends the thread class, or we define a class that implements the runnable interface. Now, whether you define a class that extends the thread class, or whether you define a class that implements the runnable interface, the class will have a method called run, because the runnable interface basically wraps this in a thread and passes the run to the threads run. And so what you're going to want to do is create your object, get it uh, instantiated, and then call the run behavior to run the thread. So to invoke the threads, you call the start method. The start method that's inside the thread actually creates the thread itself. Then the new thread that you've created, because you have to create the thread object, remember, the new thread calls the run method, and the run method is what actually does the work. So when you're ready to have the new thread going, you call start to create the new thread, and then you call run to invoke the thread. So here's how this looks in code. If we're going to build it from the ground up, we have a class called myThread. And since we're going to build this class from the ground up, we say it extends thread, meaning it's based upon the existing thread class. So since it's based upon the existing thread class, the existing thread class has a behavior called run. And we just provide our version of run to say what we want the thread to do. And then once we set that up, then the actual code to actually run this is we create a new instance of my thread. And remember we use the keyword new to do that. And then we simply call upon start. And then start automatically, without us having to do anything, start automatically invokes run. And then run goes ahead and does whatever we want. So setting things up if we're building a class from the ground up is simple and straightforward. 
What happens, though, if we're doing this with an existing class where it's not from the ground up? OK, well, if it's not from the ground up, then we take our class and it has to implement the interface runnable. Now, again, our class can implement multiple interfaces. So we say public class, in this case, it's calling it my runnable. And the point is that the class then implements the runnable interface. Now, if it's going to implement another interface, you simply say implements runnable, implements whatever. So you can have multiple implement statements. And then, because it's implementing the runnable interface, the runnable interface supplies a method called run. And there's the run method. Now, how do we actually run the thread to deal with it? We create a new instance of my runnable. And then we create a thread based upon that new runnable object. So we're actually going to create a new thread object and pass the runnable as an argument. And then once we've created the new thread based upon our runnable, then we go ahead and we call start. So we'll either create the thread directly from the ground up, or we'll create it indirectly by passing our runnable to the constructor, the thread. But either way, we're going to create a new thread, and we're going to call start. And then once we call start, it takes care of calling run, and run is going to do the actual work for our thread. A lot of times, you don't really want to name the threads because you really don't care too much about the name of the thread. But if you are explicitly want to, some of the thread constructor methods can take a string argument. And that string argument can be provided as the second argument to the thread constructor. So if you're passing, taking a thread constructor, and the first argument is this runnable, the second argument can be a text string. And that text string actually gives the name of the thread. So if you wanted to later on see that it's the file transfer thread that's screwing up or the draw image thread that's screwing up, you can actually name your thread. And then subsequently, you can call thread.getName to retrieve the name of the thread. Now, we've talked about the run method. And the run method is used to execute the behavior of the thread. The start method is used as our trigger to call upon run. Thread.isAlive is simply a Boolean behavior that returns true or false to let you know if the thread is currently running. If the thread is running, the thread is going to run until either the processor decides that there's another thread running with higher priority, or you explicitly call sleep on the thread. And if you call sleep on the thread, then you give sleep a certain number of milliseconds to tell the sleep thread to pause, and that will give control of the CPU back from the thread. So basically, if you tell the thread to sleep, you can tell it to go to sleep for a certain number of milliseconds. The yield uh, behavior simply says, OK, well, I'll keep running. But if there is a thread that's running with a higher process or higher priority, I'll let the CPU have its behavior. Sleep simply says, pause the thread for a certain amount of time. And then since we pause the thread for a certain amount of time, then another process can take it over. Yield simply says, I'm going to keep running, but I'll yield the CPU for a while. Thread.join, on the other hand, allows a process to attach to an existing process that's still going. We mentioned earlier several different methods. Now, the wait method allows a thread to wait for another thread to complete. And you can also use the notify method to notify a particular thread when it's been completed. The wait and notify behaviors, as well as the notify all behavior, is inherited from the thread class all the way down from the class object. So that's another one of those items that every object knows how to do, is how to wait for its termination, notify others of its termination, and notify all registered ones of its termination. Now, the start behavior, the yield behavior, the sleep behavior, and the join behavior are themselves in the class thread. The interface runnable has the run behavior in it. Now, we talked earlier about synchronizing threads. Now, let's say that we have a thread that is running, and it has used the synchronized behavior to 
lock access and it's busy doing something. Now another thread comes in and it tries to access the same variables that are being locked by the previous thread which is doing this um, thread safe behavior. Then the second thread which is coming in, thread B if you will, will be blocked and that blocking will occur at the synchronized point when it tries to access the same variables that were being protected by thread A. Now blocking of this thread which is what you expect to happen when it's synchronized is essentially equivalent to calling two different behaviors on the thread. It's essentially equivalent to calling suspend on the thread and then resume on the thread because when we call synchronized we are essentially locking the current thread and locking the variables accessed by that object any other thread that tries to access those variables will automatically suspend itself until the synchronized lock goes away and then once the synchronized lock goes away then the thread resumes. Now the point here is that the behavior is equivalent to calling suspend and then calling resume but essentially it's the Java virtual machine that's doing this. We as programmers don't have to explicitly call suspend and resume to get this because once we've synchronized any other thread that tries to get to the stuff while we have the synchronized lock on it will automatically be suspended and resumed. The Java virtual machine and the operating system will work together to determine the real-time ordering of threads. In other words when threads are going to get executed, what order they get executed, how long they have the CPU. Actual thread scheduling is platform dependent so you can't necessarily say that because threads are going to be running in a particular order on Windows they're going to be running in the same order on Mac OS X or on Linux. Thread scheduling can be non-preemptive in which case the threads run in a given order and one thread cannot arbitrarily push itself to the front or you can have preemptive uh, thread scheduling in which case one thread can take over the control and then can push another thread into the background. So whether it's non-preemptive or preemptive will depend upon your operating system. If you want to find out the ID or handle on the current thread there is a static method called current capital T thread. So if we call thread dot current thread you'll find a get a handle back to the current thread. If the current thread can yield behavior on the processor then the current thread can call its own yield behavior. When it calls the yield behavior it gives up temporary CPU control to any other thread that needs to run at the current time. When threads get set up threads get either a normal priority, a higher than normal priority or a normal priority. Now by default each thread gets a normal priority which means it doesn't get the CPU any longer than any other priority. But if you want to change that priority then a thread can call the set priority behavior and then can specify as an argument an integer priority value. Basically priority of 5 is normal priority, priority of 1 is highest priority and priority of 10 is lowest priority. Calling get priority on a thread returns its current priority. So to summarize this discussion about threads We've talked about why you would want to create and use threads in a Java application. Basically you would want to be able to have your Java process be able to carry out multiple threads of execution often simultaneously within the same current process. We use threads to be able to do that. Threads are multiple lines of execution contained within the same process. Threads share access to the same variables and the same memory. When we want to create threads we can either use the thread class to construct a new thread from the ground up or we can use the runnable interface to take an existing class and endow it with the ability to be run as a thread. We've seen that there are several different thread modifiers that we can use to adjust the priority of a thread, get the priority of a thread and then put the thread to sleep and then restore it as necessary. We've seen that the synchronized modifier allows us to temporarily block other threads from accessing variables in a current object while that thread is accessing it and then when the synchronized block leaves other variables are free to access those threads. This brings us to the end of our presentation on threads in Java. I'd like to thank you for viewing this presentation and I invite you to view the other presentations in this series as well. If you have questions regarding any of the content covered in this presentation please use the question and comment box 
that's located below.